you know, I took a huge risk and I can't recommend enough to everyone. Like, you know, we are often afraid of taking risks because of a number of reasons, but you know, sometimes like exactly, you never know how it's going to end, you know, what outcomes gonna, it's going to have. Uh, it doesn't always have a positive outcome, but you, always learn something even if you fail and you know again this the word fail like the life is about learning and failing uh so that's that's why even if it was challenging and difficult i'm really really happy i did it i wouldn't go through that again not at all but um uh, but yeah those three years were you know life-changing for me on this episode of the Learn Squared podcast, we welcome Arena Schmitikova. Arena is a map painter and environment generalist, and has worked on projects such as Lion King, Call of the Wild, and Artemis Fowl. Arena also helps develop up-and-coming artists by sharing advice on how to break into the industry, as well as offering mentorships under her Alpha Brush brand. In this episode, you'll quickly discover that Arena's passion for her craft is a pillar of her success. She's also a great example of how to go about making your own opportunities, from working on huge projects to high-profile artists seeking out Arena's expertise by taking her mentorships. And we also get an insight into how she balances all of this together. Buckle up, and let's go. Cool. All right. Yeah, let's get going. Um, Arena, thank you uh, for joining me on the podcast. Um, grateful to have you on. Let's Thanks get going. Um, origin story. Who are you? Origin story. Who am I? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm Irina and um, I'm originally from Czech Republic. Uh, I was born in a small city called uh, Trujim. And um, I'm a digital map painter and environment journalist uh, and working for film and TV. I'm also a freelance concept artist at the moment. And, um, uh, yeah, that's a short story about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I studied VFX and motion graphics back in 2018. I graduated. Yeah. And I've been in the industry since 2017. So pretty much cool. two years. Uh, and it's a mix of freelancing and also, um, uh, a full time working in the studio. And which studio do you work at? At the moment, I'm working for uh, I'm working at Milk VFX, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's it's been fun since we started again. This is the second time I work for them, and okay. it's actually my first official studio, I would say, after graduation, Brilliant. which I joined as a digital mod painter. And how long after graduation did you start working for them? Uh, actually, uh, I was fortunate enough that I. Joined them before graduation already. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I had uh, my first experience was in 2017, mm -hmm. and I worked for a studio called Animortal Studios, yeah. where I worked on a stop motion animated film called uh, Chuck Steel, nice. Night of the Vampires. And it was a super fun project. I started as a junior compositor, and then I was offered uh, to do uh, map painting because I was the only map painter in the studio. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was my kind of like first experience with VFX. And uh, during my third year, I was doing a lot of freelancing. So I was getting the experience yeah. during finishing, while I was finishing university. Yeah. So that was a good advantage for me to, you know, just jump on. <laughs> Great. Uh, even before graduation. And even before graduation, I was called uh, by Animorto Studios to work for them again. And yeah. um, I was doing concept art and my painting for some promotional stuff they did for an ISA festival in Paris. Mm -hmm. So that was fun as well. And then I joined Milk. Brilliant. So you wear a lot of hats, concept art, matte painting, even uh, compositing. Um, what mm -hmm. did you study at university? Uh, I studied uh, visual effects and motion graphics. Okay. But I was clearly focusing on... Uh, visual effects and mm -hmm. when I joined the university I actually wanted to be a compositor got it why, why do you want to be a compositor what I was like it about the, that yeah. job 
Um, it was, you know, like when I started VFX, like I was so amazed by all the green screen stuff and yeah. uh, that you actually get to work with, you know, keying, uh, uh-huh. green screen footage and stuff and putting all of the elements together. But then I sort of like, experienced it and then I explored uh, the mm-hmm. other areas of the FX. And I met one of my friends, Stephanie, and she was doing map painting. And it was yep. the first time I was like, oh, huh, I like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe maybe I want to try that. Uh, so I tried it and I, com- I, I fell in love, fell in love with it. And nice. it was in second year. And since then, I, I decided this is, this is what I really want to do. Brilliant. Is that like what you your main work is at the moment? Is it mainly uh, map painting or is it still like a bit of switching different roles depending on what the job requires? Um, it's mainly map painting and mm-hmm. uh, CG environment at the moment. Um, in terms of like compositing, uh, you as a map painter, you do kind of compositing stuff, sure. but nothing... Like, I can't call myself a compositor. Yeah. And was like, how was that transition for you? Um, was it something that was, do you have to have some kind of strategy behind it? Like you thought, okay, I need to do this to make sure, like basically to get your mindset focused on being a map painter. Was it something that was natural? Um, I think it was natural, kind of, mm-hmm. because um, back in Czech Republic, I studied photography and uh, yeah. applied media. So I... Uh, knew Photoshop and I knew how camera works and sure. uh, how photograph in general works. So that was a good advantage again for me to start with something like map painting and creating mm-hmm. photorealistic stuff. Uh, obviously, when I started out, I sucked. <laughs> like, you know, you start <laughs> like images together and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And now when you look at it, you're like, oh my God. Like, oh my gosh. well, I started somewhere, you know. Yeah, no, I think I st- we've all had that. Yeah, like uh, in terms of mindset, um, yeah, it was, um, you know, it was challenging because at university we had amazing lectures, yeah. but we didn't really have map painting classes. Sure. So, and so that was kind of up to us to learn this type of stuff. Like, we mm-hmm. had one lecture where we were uh, taught how to do projection mapping. Sure. Um, but that was it. Um, and you kind of had to really hustle your way through, I would say. Okay. Um, and since I had only one year and a half to sort of, because I set myself a goal that yeah. once I finish university, I must get a job. Like, yeah. that's yeah. it. And I would yeah. be a mapping. So I had a year and a half to pretty much learn everything, you know, learn the, the artistic stuff, which was a bit easier for me because, again, I studied art before. Mm-hmm. But the technical stuff, so learning the software like Nuke, Maya, uh, learning a little bit of Mari and really get to know as many softwares as I can to do the job. Yeah. Um, I would like to know more about your early art career, well, your early art journey um, before prior to uni. However, before we get to that, um, I'd like to know a bit more about your map painting journey in terms of how you learned it, like you mentioned, it was something you had to do off your own back. Um, how did that feel? Was that something that was very stressful? How did you find the resources? Or is that something that you kind of enjoy? Like trying to figure out something that there's um, technically no set path for? I started out, like one of my first courses was Learn Sword Course by mm-hmm. Max Burr, And I yeah. loved his work much and Shout his course Max. really <laughs> and um his course really really helped me to uh, get myself to know photoshop even a little bit more get myself to know the mindset behind creating my painting mm-hmm. um so yeah this is that that's where i started but i also knew that it's not just about you know mixing images together in yes. photoshop like there's uh something called art fundamentals that we need to learn sure. uh, exploring light and you know learning observe like you know little details and perspective and stuff stuff yes. like that so yes. there was a lot of studies at the beginning um where i did a lot of like drawing paintings and uh just practices for myself um 
But in terms of like the resources, this is where I probably mentioned the guide that I uh, wrote last year. Yes, we'll definitely uh, touch upon that. And um, I wrote it because exactly because when I started out, I felt like there are resources out there, but it's all over the internet. Mm. And it took a lot of time to find it. Plus, uh, you know, if you go to YouTube and you type in like uh, map painting for beginners, mm -hmm. there are sometimes videos or like tutorials that are really misleading and they're not yes. really explaining what you really need to learn or do in order to become a map painter. So that's why I decided to create a guide and be like, uh, okay, so you need to learn perspective, you need to learn composition, lighting, and stuff like that. And I basically just linked all of those people who are interested in learning that mm -hmm. to the right sources that I think the ones that I learned from. Actually, let's touch upon that. Um, because one of the first things that caught my attention about yourself is because I take, I'm basically in charge of like the social media side of Learn Squared and a few other things. And um, obviously you shared a lot of our posts when it came to some of the map painting courses. And then checking upon your work, I found out that you you had your resource about map painting and obviously getting people to get into the industry. And looking a bit deeper, that's something that you're clearly, something that's not something you're just doing just for the sake of it. There's like a, a passion behind it. And you've touched upon it as well, mentioned that trying to find the resources yourself just took a lot of time and a lot of discovery to find out what's good and what's bad. Um, but nevertheless, that is a, still a fair bit of work to get that done whilst trying to manage your career and perfect your own craft as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd like to know a bit more about that. Like, why are you doing this? And um, which I think is great that you're doing it as well. Um, and how has that journey been doing that? Um, you know, it's a, it's a funny one. Like when I started this, uh, it was when I was at NPC London mm -hmm. and, uh, I was coming to work every single morning, super early to mm -hmm. avoid the public transport in London. So <laughs> yes. busy time. So I came in early and I always took my laptop with me and I was like, well, you know, sometimes, sometimes I was doing just like morning practices, like modeling or drawing yeah. or yeah. some quick math paintings. And, um, I had this idea or like, I was thinking about that obviously during the process of my learning and I was like, oh, I, I wish <laughs> there was a source <laughs> I can go to and that would be everything I need to know. Yes. Um, uh, but then when I was at MPC and I was thinking one morning, like, oh, what I'm going to do, I was like, well, let's do this, you know, like let's, let's write a guide for people. Yes because people have been asking me a few times, like, how did I get to the industry? And I was uh -huh. like, well, you know, when you keep like repeating the same story, you're like, well, let's just write one thing and just yeah. <laughs> send those people to this source yes. uh, so they can all read it. So I kind of connected this with the idea of actually creating the guide that can help uh, entry-level artists uh, to sort of, you know, join the industry one day. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea what all it will bring. Like it brought, like I would, I would call it a, a big success. Um, great, great. And it attracted a lot of attention to my name. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I started talking to people I thought I will never start talking to, mm -hmm. and. Um, it was it was really good. Like it was sometimes time consuming. I also had an amazing helper, um, Stephanie Daly, who uh, is now my painter as well. Yep. Um, so yeah, she was helping me out. So that was that was a good help and good thing um, about that. But yeah, it was kind of time consuming, but it was so worth it. Like when I finished it, I felt yeah. like oh, I achieved something. And this is something that can really help people. And thankfully, it really helped people. And I keep getting notifications about downloads. And it makes me just super happy that um, people like it, you know. That's amazing. And, I, and congratulations for doing that. Because um, as, as you mentioned, that is, it's still an effort to do. And But the fact that you still did it and put it out there 
and it also shows that just even just sharing knowledge and helping people can go a really long way in terms of like just changing people's careers or giving them a start or even just like a a bit of a nudge i mean like what was the like even prior to that say for your journey for yourself um Mm -hmm. i guess there might have been certain instances where someone have may have given you like a little nudge in a certain direction or maybe a little point of saying hey do this instead and it might have you know open a lot more doors or even like change your workflow a little bit and for you to do the same um on this level i I think is great so what kind of like that like how has it changed things for you uh like when i released the guy yes um like first of all also regarding the guide when i was writing it i learned a lot myself like you know it's something like when you do math painting or when you do your work it's one thing to know how to do it but then it's the other thing to know how to explain it to others what you're doing yes so that's something i really really learned um and in terms of what all it changed, it changed the fact that, um, you know, I was getting, as I said, like I got a lot of attention to my name. So I was getting a more job offers as well, mm. uh, more attention on Instagram. So there, there were also new job offers or freelance stuff that came my way. Um, and also I would say... I got in touch with people or like the juniors or entry level artists, they started talking to me and um, that's where I came up with the idea of mentoring, which I started Mm -hmm. this year at the beginning of this year. And um, I got signups from people I would never think that (laughs) I would ever mentor, you know? So uh, that's one of the biggest achievements I would say uh, of, this entire thing um so yeah that's brilliant um well have you started the mentorships yet uh so yeah so i started in in january i actually i started in uh in december okay with one girl and then i was like well let's let's try more people so i had eight people from january um and the mentorship lasted for two months Mm -hmm. And it was a good test for me to mm. sort of test out like how can I time manage, you know, my full time job, my freelance stuff, yes, and uh, mentoring as well. And to be honest, like this is this is the time where I start sort of like really pushed my limits. Okay. Um, and it was kind of tiring, but it was a good test for myself whether I can do it or not. Sure. Uh, the mentorship itself, I would say, was. Uh, had a really good results cool. um but i ended at the end of february and then i planned to start again in april but mm-hmm. things changed sure. <laughs> and yeah. COVID. Yeah. yes uh, so people really couldn't uh, afford to pay for mentorship plus uh i had other priorities so i just postponed it okay. and i'm going to start again probably soon but Brilliant. since I'm sort of like rebuilding the whole uh, Alpha Brush idea and the mentorship program, yeah, uh, I'm not sure when exactly it's going to start. But it's oh yes, start. I forgot to mention it's actually the the name of this whole thing you're doing is Alpha Brush Academy, correct? Yes, perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's Alpha Brush. Yeah, and that, that's the everything, including obviously the guide and the mentorships. Um, yes. that's the whole lot, yeah. right? So where did um that like? Did you have a plan for this, like for it to expand to this point, or has it all been organic? Um, Did it all start with the guide really, and then it went yeah. from there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It all started with that, and then I was, um, I had it under my name. Sure. But since my friend was helping me out, I was like, well, you know, I think that I, if I ever have another person in the future who's going to help me, I don't want to have it just under my name, you know. Okay. I want to have a special, separate name for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, how I came up with the name, it was, I don't know, it was probably like one morning and I figured <laughs> yeah. that out. And um, yeah, that's that's how it came, came along. Yeah. Brilliant. And how is that? So obviously it's been organic, which is great because some of the best things come in an organic way. Um, even when you put super plan for things, 
those little accidents, those little surprises, those little like, okay, I didn't know things were going to go this way, but this is great to do, um, is amazing. Uh, how much time, because you mentioned, obviously, there's like trying to manage the whole thing and it really push you to your limits. Um, just to go mm-hmm. back onto the mentorships, when you had uh, eight people, was that like all at one time or was it like individual sessions with each artist? It was actually individual sessions. Mm-hmm. That's great. So that's uh, that's something I really wanted to focus on because once you have a group, they can't ask questions, you mm-hmm. know, or like they can ask questions, but you can't answer everything. Yeah, it gets a bit so, tricky like, to juggle and there's a little different there's more energy towards trying to manage all of that than as opposed to just focusing exactly on, yeah. exactly and also i'm happy that it was individual because um uh, i had a different range of people who have different skills yeah. so some people they already been in the industry for a long time mm-hmm. uh some of them were concept artists uh mm-hmm. like for example john sweeney who was oh, in wow. my mentorship yeah. <laughs> program Brilliant. and um there was also a motion graphics artist um or three entry level artists who didn't know anything about map yeah. painting. So, you know, that's where you kind of had to spend a little bit more time with them to explain yeah. them other stuff. Um, but they learned a lot from the guide, which was the good advantage of, you know, having the mentorship and be like, okay, read the guide first. Yes. And if we finish it, then we can start. Great. So it kind of like set the set the tone of what's to come as opposed to like trying to break that barrier first then get onto it so yeah i think that's really really smart um uh so you had different people at different skill levels what was the pros and cons of that would you say if any um from your end um again for me i learned a lot again um Mm -hmm. the pros and cons um it was especially because like I had to obviously adapt myself during the day. If I, I usually did the mentorships on Sunday. So I okay. had usually like six or five mentorships, uh, which lasted like an hour or something yeah. like that. Um, so sometimes I had to, since it was like five, six people, um, I always had to realize like where this person is. Yes. Um, and since it was pretty much, you know, I had like 10 or 15 minutes break only between each mentorship. Yeah. It was like, okay, get, let's get ready for this one, you know? <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, I can't, I can't really say like, there was nothing bad about it. Like Brilliant. it was, it was a good challenge. Yeah. Uh, and I learned a lot and I learned a lot also from them, Yes. you know, um, because it's all about, and that's what I really liked about the mentorship. A program that mm-hmm. uh, we communicated you know i get mm. to meet another people who are super passionate about the same thing i'm doing yeah uh, they're super excited about hearing what i'm going to tell them you know the same as they sometimes came up with a technique or something an yes. idea that you know i was like wow like i didn't expect this this is amazing you know and then for example like receiving the homeworks just you know seeing the progress like in two months yes. was stunning that's amazing. Um, and obviously we'll touch upon John a little bit. Um, like how did it affect, well, not so much affect, but like, what was it like when you, cause obviously had different people, different levels. Did you find it natural to kind of switch your approach, um, from obviously mentoring somebody who's has little experience particularly obviously in the map painting field, but maybe just overall in their career in general versus mm-hmm. somebody who's, maybe not so um, experienced in the, the the field that you're teaching, but mm-hmm. is um, very experienced in the industry in general. Like, did um, did you find that easy to switch or was that something that you kind of ha- had a process for? Um, I think I'm quite good at this type of thing, like, you know, adapting myself and getting conversations. Obviously... Um, it um, sometimes was a little bit more challenging to explain to someone who doesn't have any experience, Mm -hmm. uh, like how the industry works or Mm -hmm. who doesn't know Photoshop as much, you know, so it took a little bit longer, uh, or I had to repeat myself like multiple times, which is okay, you know, but again, like since we had one hour, usually you have to like, kind of like 
push all the information in, into that one hour, like more than with the person who already knows that. So you can kind of like easily move forward because you don't have to explain the details. Uh, but, um, you know, that's, that's what it was. The, that's what this was about and yeah. um at the end of the day like it it wasn't as difficult but maybe sometimes a little bit challenging but sure. um but yeah but it sounds like you're definitely up for the challenge regardless of what it is yeah yeah <laughs> I, I definitely am <laughs> yeah um i am always <laughs> is that like i guess it's part of your personality um it's been part of my personality since I started university, I would say. Okay, okay. What <laughs> yeah. prior to that, maybe not so much, or is that the kind of time you noticed it um, more? I guess, uh, yeah. So, like the the, the story, uh, the origin story, like how yes. I came to doing VFX was again. I studied uh, photography and media, and when I was sixteen, I met my friend Michael, and we started filming documentaries and stuff, and that's where oh. I sort of found myself that I really like doing moving picture rather than still mm. picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was experimenting with that. Um, and I even filmed a documentary about a dance group called Neon. Uh, so I spent three months with them um, traveling around uh, Czech Republic and yeah. filming them. Wow. And when I was 17, it was, uh, I, we had even a cinema screening and I saw it and I was wow. like, Hmm, I really want to do film, I think. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know about VFX. Like, that wasn't, like, the thing. Okay. Uh, but then I went to see Pacific Rim. Yeah. And I know, like, the story isn't as exciting, but the VFX. <laughs> I yes. was leaving the cinema, and I thought to myself, this would be really cool to do. Like, you know, yes. like, this is so cool. But since the VFX scene in Czech, it, let's say, um, I would never even think about doing anything like that. Mm. And then I finished secondary school. Um, I moved to Prague. Uh, I was really naive, uh, thinking that everyone will give me a photography job <laughs> or that I will get a job in a studio and I will do editing or something yeah. like that. But obviously, that's not how that works. Um, and I started, I actually started in Burger King and okay. I worked there for six months. I was super fun, but you know, money wasn't yes. really good. Yes. Um, and then I moved to a, do a receptionist, night receptionist at to a four star hotel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I spent a one and a half year and it was, uh, I would say mentally exhausting for me. Mm -hmm. And. I really, really, really didn't like that job. Like, I hated it. What about it and, did you not like? Sorry? What about it did you not like? What was it? What was it? Um, it was probably, you know, I was kind of dying there. Like, mm. you know, I was doing 12 hours long shifts. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't doing anything creative. Even like on the side, I was still experimenting. Like I was doing music, a little bit of graphic design. I was doing also web design. Mm. Uh, I was trying to really find myself uh, what I want to do, but I, st I was still stuck in that job. You it's know? a big time drain, right? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, yeah. So like that was the beginning of 2015 and it was mm -hmm. New Year's Eve and I was at work stuck at work uh, my friends were calling me like hey we are enjoying the new UC, blah 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 <laughs> i was like oh my god i hate it here <laughs> i'll go home um and it was like the moment when i decided i was like well i really really need to do something with my life yeah but i was kind of like really lazy and okay uh, i didn't do much at uh, then when i was kind of fed up with that job uh, i was like in july or something like that um, I thought, well, what can I do? Like, you know, my contract ends in three months. Uh, I don't want to stay here. Mm. I'm going to leave. But where where will I go? And then I get this idea to go back to studying. Okay. And um, when I uh, searched, like, universities, I was like, oh, what about, like, studying in, like, abroad? Mm. So I typed in studying abroad and found a page called Unilink. Um, they had like free me meetings where you could go and like listen to what it is like to study in the UK. Mm -hmm. So I went there, um, 
the same day they sent me a list of schools um uh, where i could study because like what they asked me what what do you want to do and i told them that i want to do either film yeah so like more like a digital graphics or something like that okay. or i want to do it and coding that mm. was also one of the experiments i was doing nice um so they sent me the list of universities and i picked the one in wales in cardiff cool uh i applied in two weeks they sent me an email that uh, my application got approved and mm. basically in a month i was moving i just quit my job awesome. and i was like okay i'm gonna do this and i moved to the uk and i decided okay well since i'm taking a huge risk now um i'm just going to do it properly yeah go all in yeah exactly <laughs> brilliant i think there's something about taking a risk where you know that okay it's almost like i guess like a leap of faith you know it's either going to end badly yeah. or end well and there's a the fact that there's no cushion to fall back on yeah most of the time you do hear that people say you know there's a positive story at the end but there's something that kind of like definitely pushes you forward to make yeah. sure you do succeed. Um, were there yeah. any like uncertain moments during that time? Or was it pretty much like once you made that leap yes. of faith, it was almost like, you know, everything. Kind no, of that was out. definitely ups and downs. Uh, a lot of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. uh, I struggled financially quite a lot since mm. uh, I had to obviously in my own money for the university and stuff. Well, I was, um, sorry, I was to interrupt. I was going to ask, like, cause I know with the over here with foreign students, your fees are like almost, I guess, a lot more than what it is just from people from here as well. Um, so I can only imagine that must have been crazy just to even sort that out. Yeah, it was. Uh, thankfully, like in the UK, uh, you get to um, uh, you get a loan yeah. to cover the university fee, but if you want to, you know, you need to pay rent and food and some social yeah, life eat and, and you know, all that kind of stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh there was a lot of ups and downs with that um and managing time and i would say that's probably also good to mention mm. uh i wasn't looking after my mental health as much okay and i was really really pushing pushing myself to mm. the maximum limits i've ever had and i i almost didn't sleep um because I was really, really motivated that yes. I need to get a job, you know, like this yes. needs to work out. But then it was in third year um, and it was 2018. And I remember I had a presentation uh, with my homeworks and and I had an absolute breakdown uh, oh, no. where I almost thought I'm going to quit. Or like I thought I'm going to quit. And then my lecturer, uh, Rosie Walker, actually, she uh had to stop me she had a conversation with me you you know that about like the whole situation yeah and uh, yeah that's pretty much why i finished the university thanks to probably the talk i had with her amazing uh, but yeah it was it's been really it was really challenging but that again uh, i'm really happy i did it because you know, I took a huge risk and I can't recommend enough to everyone. Like, you know, we are often afraid of taking risks mm -hmm. because yep. of a number of reasons. But, you know, sometimes like exactly, you never know how it's going to end. Yes. You know, what outcome gonna, is going to have. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't always have a positive outcome, but you always learn something, even if you fail and you know, again, this, the word fail, like life is about learning and failing. Yes. Uh, so that's that's why even if it was challenging and difficult, I'm really, really happy I did it. I wouldn't go through that again, not <laughs> at all. But, uh, but yeah, those three years were, you know, life changing for me. It was a three year course, right? Yes. Perfect. Um, just to touch up on the mental health sort of things, if you don't mind, um, mm -hmm. when did you notice, like, okay, there's something going on? Because from my own personal experiences with it as well, it's like I've had to always have someone either point it out to me or find mm -hmm. out when it's either too late or like similar to yourself, as like some kind of breakdown or you realize, okay, something's not clicking and it's because of this. Like, what was that moment for you? Or was it like uh, a bunch of things? 
it was a bunch of things, you mm-hmm. know, like, um, I, as I said, like I, I didn't sleep much. And, mm-hmm. um, again, my lectures pointed out multiple times, uh, <laughs> I should work less, um, <laughs> and I should look after my mental health. Um, but yeah, like, obviously I was not using it on myself, like how I feel, you know, mm-hmm. because I was really overworking myself and instead of working smart, I was working hard. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and I didn't see it really because I was like, no, 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 I really need to work hard, you know, to, to, to get the job, um, and made the university, I made the best out of the university. Yes. Yes. But I obviously, I was blind, you know, at that moment, like, mm-hmm. um, and again, I was working hard instead of working mm. smart. And that's mm. something that is really important to either have someone to tell you, um, yes. or, you know, you have, which happens <laughs> often to, to a lot of us that you have a breakdown and you're like, well, maybe I should reevaluate mm. what I'm doing. You know, am I taking care of my mental health like enough? Um, what are my eating habits? You know, how much do yeah. I sleep? Um, and all of that stuff. Uh, so I went through that period mainly during university. Um, and again, I can't say I'm thankful for that. <laughs> I, w- I would be happier if it didn't happen, but sure. I learned a lot about myself thanks but to that. I guess it's like, it's like a journey, isn't it? Once you reach the end and it's the end you wanted, then obviously it's a positive feeling. It's like a feeling of accomplishment and success. But of course, every step wasn't, like you mentioned, perfect. There was some stumbles, there was some trips, there was some falls along the way, some bumps and bruises. Mm -hmm. And it's always at that moment when it doesn't feel right. But, um, and I I think you'll agree with me, when uh, you are going for like, say, especially in the creative realm or when you're trying to push for something, you're not getting the results that you want. And it feels like, Mm -hmm. I want to give up and this is just a nightmare. Um, the moment that you get what you want or um, it pulls off, you almost forget all of that pain that happened before. It's mm-hmm. almost already archived and think, okay, I remember that happened, but the, you know, the goal has been reached. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So I, again, obviously with your experience as well, I'm sure going forward after that, it was a lot easier to um, push yourself even further because you also knew that, what your limits were, I guess. And maybe it was about finding limits. Would you say, looking back, that's perhaps what it was? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And even uh, though you... Sorry, yeah, go on, carry on. No, no, it's it's fine. Thank you. Um, even though you said you wouldn't do it again, if you did, um, but you could also guide yourself, you could leave your own little how to survive university guide as, a, as opposed to your map painting guide. What, what I tips... Should write it. <laughs> what tips would you tell yourself and what kind of things would you say like I guess non-negotiables that okay Arena you're going to do this this is what you must follow without fail um okay so uh when you say like without fail I would always say you have to fail in order to learn sure okay but, yes, yes uh I would definitely say and this is something I'm also mentioning in the guide <laughs> And also always telling my mentees or whoever talks to me about my journey in the industry mm-hmm. is really, really, really look after your mental health and your mm-hmm. health in general. So um, have a good eating habits, uh, have a good time schedule, have a morning routine. You know, like, for example, morning routine helped me a lot mm-hmm. uh, when I was trying to get out of the um the the situation I was in, um, you know, read more, spend more time with your friends, really make that time to spend it with your friends. Don't mm-hmm. just work. Mm. Um, and probably when you're working or like when you're learning something, set yourself a time for a specific time of the day where you're going to learn. Like, yep. okay, let's say I'll come from uni, I'll come back home from uni at uh, five. Yeah. And I'm going to have a dinner and now I'm going to set the timer and I'm going to learn for, let's say, two or three hours, you know, or two hours or one hour, you know, uh, and then I'm going to go out with my friends. And in that one hour, turn off your phone, turn off everything you have around yourself and just focus on learning. Um, and that's that's working smart, you know, mm-hmm. instead of working hard. Um 
for learning smart <laughs> instead of learning hard. Um, but yeah, that would be probably one of my advices. Uh, but mainly that the number one is to look after your health. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there's, I guess like that's a kind of in a general sense that we can control. But at the same time, if it's something that like, and I think it goes without saying as well, um, if it's something that you're something you're really struggling with, definitely seek medical advice as well. Because obviously yes. there's only certain things that we can control. Sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, speak to the experts and they can sort it out. But for the most part, I think with artists as well, with like yeah. the pressure we put on ourselves, the expectations, what we want to achieve, the skills we need to push for, we definitely mm-hmm. bring a lot of that on ourselves, which also means mm-hmm. that we can take it off ourselves as well. Um, yeah. When would you say like, I guess the routine you just mentioned now and the, the processes that you have, is that something you strictly follow at the moment or does it depend on how things are going are you quite flexible with things uh i would say at the moment i was really strict with it um until the COVID happened (laughs) (laughs) um i had a really uh strict schedule um i I wouldn't call it strict actually because that's something i just did you know like that was part of me at the beginning it was i had to be strict in order to in order for that morning routine I wanted to do every morning mm. to become a habit. So I wasn't, I didn't have to push myself then anymore. So like at the beginning of the year, I, for example, I woke up at five thirty, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, I did exercise or something like that. Um, Great. and, uh, you know, I had a good breakfast as well, guys, mm-hmm. it's important to have a breakfast <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, uh, people struggle with sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I always tried to do something in the morning. So I had the feeling that I've already done something in that day. So if I didn't do something in the evening, I could say, oh, I did something in the morning. Yeah. Um, as I'm a morning person, I love mornings. Yes. Uh, so yeah. And the, um, like these things, were there something that you came to your own conclusion or were you like researching things, getting advice off others? I was researching a lot. Okay, I, yes. I started reading a lot of books about like motivation and, uh-huh. you know, all successful people. Uh, what, what is their recipe for, you know, them yes. to be healthy and successful. Um, so I read a lot. And one of my, the first books that helped me a lot was uh, Your One Word. Mm-hmm. It's written by Evan Carmichael and he's having a YouTube channel. Um, which all, which was also part of my morning routine. Actually, I was watching okay. every single morning one of his videos. Wow. Uh, where there was an interview with I don't know Gary V, Tony Robbins, yeah. Mel Robbins, Rachel Hollis, uh, and all these successful people, and they were giving advice to the people maybe who are lost or you know who are struggling, who wants to achieve something, but they have uh, they struggle with confidence and all that stuff. So that's something that really, really helped me. But again, yeah, a lot of reading, a lot of mm. researching, but also uh, not every technique. You so you have to find your own technique. So you have yes. to get inspired. You're inspired by them, but then you kind of find, or you're looking for what is what suits you. Yeah, I guess it's like um, to use an art. Uh, analogy um, or a metaphor is like a Photoshop. You don't have to use the person teaching you their layout of Photoshop. The tools are still the same. You can lay out how you need to. That makes you work in a better way. Um, maybe that's a mm. terrible example, but um, you know, it's just about making those adjustments, like you said, to suit your needs yeah. because that's totally fine to do so. Um, would you say? Obviously, there's always more to learn. There's always more to like, especially in terms mm. of like just managing and balancing life and you know, as this year has proven, you never know what's around the corner and how it's going to affect Mm -hmm. you um, and especially work and everything else as well. Uh, Would you say in terms of how you've developed as an artist, how you developed as a person, um, even as a student and having that grit and that drive, would you say you kind of got the tools in place now to um, keep pushing forward and know how to manage things? Or would you say there's always, is there something missing that you'd like to add to that? Um... I wouldn't say missing because there's mm. always, as you said, you know, there's always a lot to learn. Mm. And 
I would say I have, I'm surrounded by amazing friends and artists who are, you know, helping me and I'm helping them, you know, we're supporting each other as a community. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I've got to know myself now. I can say, like, I know myself, mm. like I know my limits. I know what I can do. Uh, so, uh, I would say I, I have all the tools, but mm -hmm. again, if there's still tons of what I want oh, to learn sure. I want sure. to meet and, uh, you know, people I want to meet and then talk to and learn from. So, uh, that's, that's probably the, the best answer I can give you. No, for that. I, I think it's a great answer. And even like this industry and this, this field that we're in, um, as, as morbid as it sounds, and that's not my intention to do so, is um, there's so much to learn, there's so many people to meet, there's so many experiences to experience that technically we can still discover something new until our last mm -hmm. breath. So that, that's something cool. Like you're never going to, you know, finish it and then be like bored of what to do next. There's always something next to do. And I think for me, that's like super. Yeah. And especially yeah, in helps, yeah. industry, like, you know, like you see all of the that are like developing like you see blender everywhere you mm. know houdini you know unreal engine right now and yes uh you know it it at some point like it's in some moments it's kind of overwhelming because like i'm the type of person who's like oh my god i want to learn that you know yeah, but now i'm learning something else so i'm going to learn it after i finish this yeah, one yeah. and then there's a new tutorial coming about blender and i'm like oh my god i finally need to start i need to start with blender yeah, yeah, yeah. uh and my friend is now learning blender and i'm like you know, she's constantly talking about that. Or like, <laughs> I have more friends who are constantly talking about yeah. that. And they keep pushing me to start. But I'm like, no, I'm learning this now, you know. Uh, but I see myself that I probably, there is going to be one more tutorial about Blender. And I, I'm opening that software and <laughs> I need to start learning <laughs> immediately. Yeah, I think I, I, I cracked under the pressure like a few months ago. Um, uh -huh. It was just like... Because even like last year, I've had it installed on my computer for like a couple of years now. Basically, since it became cool, I was like, okay, let, let's check it out. Because uh, mm -hmm. what, what is your main package at the moment? Um, at the moment, obviously, it's Photoshop, Maya, yeah. and Duke. Um, okay. But I'm experimenting with Houdini. Um, I was learning mm -hmm. Unreal Engine, actually. Uh, went to a few weeks ago, uh, I finished because I had a different priority at work. Sure. Um, I'm using ZBrush sometimes occasionally, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not really a ZBrush master to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, and sometimes I use Mari, uh, Speech Tree, and um, uh, that's that's pretty much it. Like all the like Adobe stuff in yeah, design, yeah. but uh, for for like the work, the three main softwares is Photoshop, sure. Nuke, and Maya. And when it comes to software. Like, is that something that when you open one, you're always like excited or does it, are you the opposite? Because there's also some artists that are like, oh, I don't want to learn something new and it's just annoying to learn. Like, wh where do you stand on that side? I'm definitely super excited about learning. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, you know, sometimes I feel people struggle. It's, it's not that they don't want to learn that, I feel. It's mm. more the fear of learning something and they know that they will be failing and it's going to take time mm. before they get really comfortable with the software. So, but probably it really depends, depends on, on, on people. But I, I know some uh, people around me who are afraid to open the software and start learning, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and they're afraid of the failure again, Okay, which I, I would say I'm not. I take it as well. The more I fail, the more I learn. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing for me to fail. So I like failing, basically. <laughs> and when did you like? Like, I guess we can talk uh, to answer this. Maybe going a bit, bit further back. Like, say, where do you think it comes from? Where you're quite open to looking at new things and experiment with them, and happy to put that time in. Like you said, just to fail until till you till you get it um like from my personal experience when it comes to software it's like i get super excited to the point where i want to learn it all at once to the point where it becomes unproductive because um you know you, you're only at 10 percent good at everything as opposed to being like say um very good at that one specific workflow you need to 
So I got burnt by that and I'd skate it back. And mine's more like I have to muzzle myself from certain things just because I know I'm going to spend an unhealthy amount of time trying to figure things out and it takes away from mm-hmm. the goals. Um, but mm-hmm. like, where, where does, where, where would you say that comes from for you? Because I, I think you, you sound like you're similar in that sense as well. Um, yeah, like I'm, I'm a really curious person. Mm-hmm. So for me, yes, you're right about that. You're on a 10% get like, uh, you know, in the other areas, but you have like, you have your specialty. So like you're, yes, yes. uh, you have three main softwares or four main softwares that you're doing mm-hmm. and you're mastering kind of, and whatever you learn kind of like on the top of that. And you, really needs to either like replace or like find a way how to implement the software into your workflow and really keep using it all mm. the time or yeah um i mean you know i've i've tried quite a lot of softwares but mm. let's say the software i opened two years ago like i know the interface i know some basic stuff mm-hmm. how to do but i can't say like if i'm doing a concept or if i'm gonna if I need to model something, I can't open model or something like like a software that I opened two years ago. Like yeah, yeah, for yeah. me, automatically I jump into Maya because I know I'm gonna be quick. Same. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still, like for me, it's a it's a curiosity. Like, um, but if you wanna shift your like knowledge into a new software or new workflow, you need to use it uh all the time otherwise oh, for sure. For sure. it's natural that you know we we forget you know oh yeah um i mean i mean how often have you had it where you use software so long or that like, you have a bit of a burst on it you kind of use it a lot then you switch to another software and still use the same hotkeys for the other software and it doesn't work because you're so used to that one um because it all yeah. have their different ways and interfaces but um <laughs> like, i think that that's one key thing where Blender is becoming a big draw, taking away the side of obviously the, the hype from it and the amazing work that people are doing. Um, I think the key thing is, is the fact that it's slowly becoming like, I, I use Maya myself. That's what I learned at university. And that's kind of what was stuck with me. Um, and, mm-hmm. and it's very, very powerful in itself as well. It's got its criticisms, mm-hmm. but it's still very powerful. You can do, you can handle a lot of stuff basically. Um, yeah. And obviously you work in the industry um, and I'm sure it's heavily using the industry also. Hence why yes. it's a popular one that's no, always is. always been taught. But Blender's mm-hmm. now becoming that. Not, not, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like as Maya or 3ds Max yet, but it's becoming like that with all the tools mm-hmm. and all the things you do, especially like from my angle as a concept artist, it's more than enough for concept art. Like you can mm-hmm. do anything you need for concept art. And it, it, the key thing is it's free. Like economically, the fact that it's free and the plugins are so cheap compared to say, you know, um the ones for Maya, etc um i think that's that's another key thing as well mm-hmm. and and even like now with um like from before how expensive software used to cost me even like before photoshop or adobe was subscription look mm-hmm. how, how much that particular package used to cost maya used to cost like how many thousands of pounds back in the day um yeah. so i think one cool thing about the industry the way well at least uh, in terms of software that's progressing is the fact that the price is coming down um mm-hmm. and you mentioned a few things like unreal and um, learning new softwares um i'd love to talk to you a little bit about houdini because i love messing around houdini as well um i don't know what mm-hmm. i'm doing in it but whatever i do there's always some great things that it's come cool. out of it and yeah, yeah. it's it seems like it's once you get the hang of it it could be like the perfect software it's like you can do everything in it like almost, almost literally. Um, yep. But like, what? Where do you think it's headed in terms of technology, and how do you think it would affect the industry going forward, especially from your perspective as a map painter? So, like, uh, how the software will change, or uh... yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, what are your predictions going forward? Um, and what would you like to see as well? Well, um, as for map painting, I feel. You know, it's moving or it's been moving now for, I don't know, two years, maybe a bit mm-hmm. more, um, more towards um, CG and uh, CG workflows, basically, and environments, mm-hmm. especially in the larger facilities uh, like in a frame store and uh, DNEC and PC. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and the map painting is just a support kind of. So I think in the future, what's going to happen, and like at Milk as well, you kind of like if you have that CG generalist knowledge in order to like create CG asset or environment, mm -hmm. it's plus for you because you can handle two jobs at the same time. So like, yeah. you know, you can model your stuff and do the overpaint and make it look amazing. Um, in terms of the softwares, um, but yeah, like, again, like, just continue. I think the CG is like the, the map painting part is going to merge with the CG role kind mm -hmm. of, but it's going to be like really like generalists who know both. Yes. Um, and as for the software, uh, I honestly have been thinking um, for quite a few months now uh, that I'm going to replace Maya for Houdini. Mm -hmm. And because actually my colleague at work inspired me because he's a Houdini master. <laughs> and mm -hmm. what he's able to do with it, like he used to use Maya like back in the days, like yeah. 10 years ago. And um then he replaced it for Houdini and he was like, Yeah, I, I just stayed with the software. Yeah. Like I love it so much. I hate Maya. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because obviously again, like yeah, Maya can do a lot, but it has a lot of limitations. For sure. Um yeah. and in terms of what it can handle, I feel like Houdini it's not just I feel like <laughs> Houdini actually handles much more. Yes. And it can do more as well. But you have to get your mindset around it and you have to really learn how Houdini works mm -hmm. because it has obviously completely different structure than For sure. or like yeah. workflow than you do do in Maya. Um so yeah like Houdini is definitely something that I think has been replacing Maya a lot, like in a lot of studios now, mm -hmm. but may replace Maya completely one day. Um it, yeah. Maybe for animation, no, but yeah, like definitely. Um, I if if someone asks me like what software I should learn, what 3D software I should learn uh, to get into the industry, I recommend to learn Houdini because more yeah. and more people are looking for people for artists who know Houdini. So mm -hmm. that's why I recommend it. Um, as for Unreal Engine, I I think. You know, I don't want to put too many predictions for that, but because everyone, everyone kind of knows and feels where this is going, and yeah. I'm super excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I also I also started learning Unreal Engine, and what those guys are doing is just mind blowing. Like Epic Games and you know Quixel and all of that stuff yes. together is, I uh, I have no words for that. Like literally, with every single release, I'm just pumped. Uh, what's your experience on Unreal? Like it's it's on my list of things to do. Um, for the very reason I mentioned before, I'm just I just know it's just gonna be like a big time drain for me, which which eventually would obviously be a good positive because you get to figure it out. Um, but obviously, like you mentioned before yourself, priorities come first. Um, but like, mm -hmm. what what would you say about it that that you're enjoying? Um, uh, obviously the real time and the speed. Like, mm -hmm. uh, plus the fact that it's actually connected. To the Quixel bridge where mm, you have Quixel free amazing. assets. Yeah. You know, you have free assets that yeah. you can just quickly move from one library into your software and you can build the world. Yeah. You know, like obviously there are technical stuff that you need to learn in order to get like super photorealistic world. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, even if you don't have uh, if you don't know like how to build a shader properly mm -hmm. and you just use literally the bridge, you still can build amazing stuff. Mm. So uh, I love how easy it is uh, for people to open software and build something in two hours. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. And it all works real time. And, and I tried it on my laptop and my laptop isn't any like, beast or anything like that and okay. it can still handle you know wow i think maybe it's because it's the real-time element like as creatives we want to see things almost immediately and maybe yes. that that's why it resonates because it's like oh that's my vision and it's there and yes exactly. and i guess it's like like lego as kids or even as adults you know lego's timeless yeah. 
But it's like, yep. that's what I imagined. Click, it's there. No need to wait. No need to render. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's the same. Um, and like you mentioned already that some studios are shifting more towards like, say, they're really adapting their workflow. Um, obviously, you mentioned more, more 3D. Um, like when you started working in the industry, what was mm-hmm. your workflow at the time? Was it mainly Photoshop initially? And uh, has your workflow changed? Or like, um, I guess uh, your day to day, what was your main, main, main tasks to do? Is it mainly Photoshop matte painting or is it um, with CG? It what? was mainly, mainly 2D. So, but yeah. I still had to learn like uh, Photoshop Nuke my app. Like that mm. was the three main software mm. that you had to know or like there are studios that are hiring people who know only photoshop but mm. you i think you know that since there are few studios you are lowering your chance as entry-level artists or junior that you're gonna get a job in other studios because mm-hmm. other studios they want you to know the technical part as well so they want you to know nuke and maya and especially mm. nuke i feel uh because you're also my painter you don't give them just a 2D image today with the client's requirements that we have. You uh, don't do still images. You do actually moving images. Mm. So you have these crazy camera movements that, you know, are requested by clients because they like it. Um, And this is where it comes to you learning nuke and projection mapping, how that works. because studios, they often have these kind of tasks and they need someone who can do this, you know, and mm-hmm. who understands the workflow. Um, but yeah, like my, my workflow, it, it's, it has changed definitely mm-hmm. uh, because I've been adapting and learning from people in the industry and developing my own workflow. Uh, but as far as software, apart from... Um, you know, the Houdini that are kind I'm kinda of adding, also Speech Tree, Z Brush. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it's it's almost the same like as for the software, but I can see myself that I'm gonna shift a little bit more towards Houdini soon. Mm. And aside from like say the um the software and the hardware and things like that as well, um what would you say like for more from like a, a psychological, strategic and mental level? Like what would you recommend artists to start thinking about or maybe a mindset to have going forward? Obviously, because at the moment, the industry is changing in, uh, I guess, in multiple different ways. Firstly, obviously, with the pandemic, it's affecting how people mm-hmm. work. But also, mm-hmm. with the technology has been changing, it's adapting, it's evolving. Certain fields are mer- merging. You used the word earlier, generalist, which potentially mm-hmm. I spoke to uh, a previous guest and literally um, the conclusion was that maybe we're all going to have to be some kind of generalists mm-hmm. to to do whatever is required. Mm-hmm. Um, like, what kind of mindset would one need to have to manage all of these changes coming up? From your um, from your perspective, I would say definitely don't limit yourself. And um, you know, as professionals, like if you again, if you want to be a map painter, mm. reach out to professionals who are in the industry and ask. Hey, uh, what software should I learn? You know, like I read mm. on the community this, but this guy says this. Can you tell me what should I learn to get to, I don't know, if you want to get to Frame Store or, I don't know, Milk, you know, MPC? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are the softwares? Like, and never sort of like, you know, people will tell you what to learn. Um, and maybe you have a desired software you would like to learn yourself, but it's not yeah. matched with the software someone from the industry told you. Yeah. So like I would say have focus on those that you are being told to learn, but mm-hmm. also don't limit yourself. You know, the more you know, the better for you always. Mm. Uh, but at the beginning, obviously, you have to have a focus yeah. um, if you want to get into the industry. Um, but again, yeah, <laughs> I would say don't limit yourself, which I feel sometimes when I was starting out, um, 
I was part of communities and I was hearing, oh no, you don't need nuke, you know, no, this, this guy doesn't mm. need, doesn't know nuke and he's still in the industry, you know, and I'm like, wow, but maybe the guy who just works for the studio where they don't require, uh, for you to know, you know, this type of software or yeah. they, they, they don't require you to know that. Um, or maybe he was lucky or he, or he knew someone. It doesn't mean that's going to be your case. So again, learn as much as you can, what are you being told to learn? And once you get into the industry, that's the point where once you're in, you kind of develop the skill and mm -hmm. then you can go even further. And that's where you have no limitations. You know, you mm -hmm. can start experimenting with, with the other softwares. And just to go back a bit towards your early part of your career, when you mm -hmm. first got your break in the industry, um, how how did it feel? Like, what was your emotions at the time? Um, what was that experience like? I'm assuming it was overall uh, positive, of course. So, yeah, so like in 2017, because, um, again, like I finished second year of my university and I really wanted to... Um, get some sort of experience before mm -hmm. my third year. And I kept applying in the studios, like, you know, MPC frame store. And I, I got rejections like from everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, apart from one Czech studio that is here in Prague and which I had an interview with and then on a mortar studio. Yeah. And then I took on a mortar studio and I started and, um, and I remember the first day coming, in and obviously like you're you're kind of like really nervous because the first yeah. day you're like can i actually do the job you know <laughs> like what if i fail you know and like you're, you're really like curious what it's gonna be like yeah um but the best thing i would say about vfx or this industry maybe it's also in the other industries the people around you are always super 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 nice mm. and uh, they're always willing to help you. So like the beginnings, uh, were really smooth for me because like, if you don't know something, they just explain you, mm. explain it to you. And if you ask 300 times again, they <laughs> explain it to you. Hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the oh, question. No, that totally does. And yeah. like, what was your, you mentioned a bit earlier, what was your first project again that you worked on or the first big, um gig that you worked on so yeah like the first big project was uh the lion king mm -hmm. and that's probably yeah that's probably worth mentioning more than yeah. uh anymore because it was obviously a huge um, lion king, yo. when i uh, sorry i was just saying yes lion king like it's huge and the fact that it was like um 100 percent cg uh meant that it must have been yeah. a ton of work right yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, uh, incredible. Like, I remember the interview I went to, uh, with Mark Genovese and I was super, super, super nervous, uh, <laughs> because I knew that it's something that can, uh, really help my career. And I really wanted to work at that piece at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and on something like Lion King, oh my God, what an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. So when I got that job, I, I couldn't believe it, honestly. Wow. And when I started out, um, I kind of felt like I already have experience and that I will know how to do the job. Great. But obviously, something like Lion King was so huge and so technically challenging that I remember my first pass and I struggled. Like, and I thought that it's a simple task, but I really, really struggled. It was mm. completely new thing. Um, completely new technique that I've never even heard of. <laughs> and, but again, back to what I said before, uh, my HOD Marco, uh, he just sat down with me and he was like, okay, I'm going to explain you how to do this. And okay. we actually, there was, there was this technical issue with that shot. And we spent, instead of like three days, we spent three weeks on it. Wow. So I was literally sitting three weeks right next to him trying to solve that technical issue while yeah. he was like explaining to me uh, what he was doing. And this is actually, I'm really, really grateful for his mentorship because I learned a lot about his own mindset, like how he yes. is approaching shop and 
how he is solving uh, technical issues like we yeah. had. Um, and it was a big learning curve for me. Wow. Like those three weeks were probably um, the, the best introduction into the <laughs> huge VM world. Um, so yeah, that was it was really really good. And after we finished it, I had a similar shot, so I kind of already knew how to do that. So mm. once I finished that one, I was really proud of myself. Amazing. Uh, but yeah, like you know, you never know what issue will come your way especially the technical ones yep. that you learn every single day and that's probably important for anyone who's listening to this who is entry level or junior and um to be aware that you don't need to and you want to know everything mm -hmm. you know once of you course, start yeah. you you learn every single day every single week every single month you know yes. um and that's that's the beauty of this industry i would say and would you say it's quite important or uh, maybe people who are not like that are not, I guess it's not something you, you, you learn, just something you pick up, but to have that mindset um, or to be prepared for something to go wrong and have that mindset to, okay, how do we get to the bottom of this problem to solve it? Because it sounds like a yeah. lot of VFX stories, nearly every big, like when, whenever you hear like on all these old films or new films, there's always that one story where you this couldn't be solved or we had this new thing to solve and there's always mm -hmm. that, that keyword there solve like always trying to solve stuff yeah. um so would you say a lot of big part of vfx is like problem solving right yeah yeah definitely that's that's something that you have to you have to learn really a lot <laughs> like uh, <laughs> or you should be ready before you even start uh in the industry and this is why exactly why the recruiters for the studios they want to see that you know nuke Mm. because that's where all the like technical stuff comes in like oh, yeah. with for example how i learned um uh, problem solving or like how i got around my first shot which actually got me into the industry back in 2008 yeah. or yeah it was 2018 shot was that um i had this stock footage which i decided to change from where i um wanted to change the season from autumn to winter mm. and the camera was moving and stuff all that and and i knew from university how to track the footage how to do rotoscoping how to do comping but like the big projection mapping technique like the proper one where you have to like create a parallax and stuff that was this was my first job mm. um and there was so many technical issues that came my way, like came along that you just, you know, you, ha you definitely you can't give up like on mm. the first fail. Um, so I kept going. And what I also did when I struggled was what you do in the studio. You ask someone, mm -hmm. but I didn't ask my lecturers. I asked people in the industry. Smart. I was like, I have this stock footage. I have this and this and that. And I explained the problem. And they literally, they wrote me a guide on how to do that. Nice. Uh, so I, I did it. And then again, I came, another issue came along and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try to solve it myself, you know, and you, you really like, you get your mindset to, um, to, uh, or like you set your mindset to sort of like think about, like you expect the problems already like you know like now mm. when i have a new shot and i see a camera movement i'm like okay so what could come like what problems or issues mm. could come with this shot um but that's something that i've learned like during those two years mm -hmm. but it's good to uh start with nuke before you start in the industry or like learn nuke in order to get to the industry mm. because that's where you sort of have your first issues and have your first problems mm -hmm. that which you learn from and that was also part of my mentorship for example like uh, we had a stock footage we were testing out and um i i told her basically uh, or like i told her okay so do this is and that and she found out that it didn't work properly and i was like okay so why do you think it doesn't work Mm -hmm. And I knew that she will do, she will make the mistake. And I wanted her to make the mistake yeah, because 
uh, that's where she learned like, oh, this is why I need to be a girl, you know? Yes. Um, so she learned to problem solve, like, and think about these kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, VFX is all about problem solving. Yeah. Now I think that that's key because let's say um, you're learning something and you just follow someone step by step and you just imitate it. Then when yeah. that problem arises, you're going to be either found out or stuck or maybe not even get work again because you know if, if things go wrong then you're unreliable um but i think like you know with many softwares you've used every software has its quirks every yeah. software has its like little ways to troubleshoot and then when you're using multiple things at once on a project that has issues as well it's like it is just all a big problem solving um party basically um what 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 are you working on next if you can mention and I cannot talk about the project. Okay. Uh, unfortunately. But how cool is it? Um, how cool is it? Yeah. Uh, it is cool. It's pretty yeah. cool. Um, okay. There are pr two projects that uh, I can't talk about, but sure. recently at Milk, we just finished a course that is on Netflix. Mm -hmm. So I was part of that as well. Nice. That was a huge, challenging sequence. Uh, me and my colleague. Um, we did, <laughs> we made it somehow yes. <laughs> during uh, lockdown and quarantine. But in terms of the project I'm working on now, I unfortunately can't talk about it. That's cool. But it's very uh, cool. <laughs> and um, going forward, hopefully with what's going on, things just get a bit clearer for everybody and get smoother and you know things become more stable, especially for the people that are out of work or can't get to work. Um, what are your plans going forward for the rest of the year and just like in general what does the future hold for you um i at the moment obviously with all the COVID situation and mm -hmm. stuff um there's a lot of uncertainty what's gonna come next uh, but at the moment what i'm focusing on is to really focus on building my own brand mm. and building my freelance path and really have my clients and work remotely from home, mm -hmm. work remotely from Czech. Um, so I actually like being back yeah. closer to my family and to my friends. Um, I, in general, enjoy more of a, like Prague is a big city, but if I compare it to London, uh, London is like super huge and super expensive. Yes. So yes. for me, Prague, is uh it's a relax basically nice um so yeah so like there are some um plans some studios that i've been talking to recently cool. and might be exciting to actually work for them on some exciting projects but again i can't can't talk about it sure uh but yeah um honestly it's just a so I think you cut off again. Even I still have yeah. my working hours. Yeah. So like I start at, let's say, 9.30, finish at 5.30. Um, I still get to manage my time, you know. So once I finish a mm. task, I can do other stuff. Or I can do my personal work, which you can't really do when you're in the studio or, any, mm. or anything like that. So I love I love freelancing. Same, yeah. I think it's great. Um, cool. I think we can end it on that. Um, I've got to head off. Thank you very much for yeah. your time, Arena. Um, we'll definitely put the links up in the description. But if you like, please go ahead and plug. Plug, plug, plug. Okay. Well, uh, on uh, they, you can find me on um, Instagram, which is it's, uh, underscore Smitakova. And uh, also on my website, which is www.arenasmitakova.com. <laughs> <laughs> And also, um, Alpha Brush you can basically find through my website sure. uh, because I have all of the links there. So uh, feel free to visit and download the free guide um, and some other exciting stuff that might be coming later this year. Lovely. We'll definitely add those links in. Um, yeah, cool. That's it. A huge thanks to Arena for being my guest. Please check out the links in this episode description where you'll find Arena's stunning work and all of the learning resources from Alpha Brush. And once you've done that, head on over to learnsquare.com and take the same course as Arena, our intro to matte painting course with Max Berman. 
All of our first lessons are free, so start learning today. Till next time. Thank you.